Welcome to the Lou Catino Show, where we can learn to reimagine our lifestyle. Dr. Lee Williams, what a pleasure, an honor, a privilege, I'm out of words to say, to have you on our show today, Reimagine Your Lifestyle. You know, I've been visualizing, I've spoken to several doctors in the US as well. We do a lot of work with, you know, with Stanford, Sloan's, Mount Sinai. And I've always said, can you connect me with Dr. Lee Williams? Can you connect me? And they were like, why, why, why do you, I just said, I want to be connected at some point. And then Mugda from my team made it happen. And I just think it's one of the best moments right now. So thank you for your time. I know how busy you are traveling, writing books, educating people, being part of your own masterclasses. So it's a privilege to have you. And I know I wouldn't do justice to introducing you. You're a physician, you're a scientist, you're a New York seller, a bestseller, but I'll allow you, Dr. Lee Williams. We have a great audience in India that's open to learning, open to looking beyond just medicine. I love your concept of molecular medicine and molecular nutrition and how you've integrated science. So over to you, Dr. Lee, take us through your journey. I'm very intrigued. Physician, science, molecular nutrition, and then a book that just brings food as medicine, not putting down allopathy as well. So I would love for you to take us through your journey. You know, maybe I'll start for your audience. And thank you so much for having me on by saying that as somebody who has grown up in the United States, but with an Asian background, I've always had an appreciation that cultures, particularly Asian cultures, where food has been very much part of the tradition, part of the life, and really not something just for nourishment, but something that actually helps us appreciate our identity is something that I grew up with. And so um, uh, my journey really uh, began with um, uh, growing up in a family with uh, a mother who's an artist, a pianist, and a uh, father who's an engineer, biomedical engineer. So I had arts and sciences, creativity and research really kind of driving me from the very, very beginning. And uh, I was a biochemist uh, in college. I studied biochemistry. And then medical school, um, I became very, very interested uh, uh, as I explored research, my research background in blood vessels and a field called angiogenesis, which is actually how our body grows and controls blood vessels. Many people don't know this, but our body is packed. Each of us listening to their watching this, uh, we are packed with 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels inside our body. So these are the highways and byways that deliver the oxygen that we breathe. So literally, you know, what we inhale and the nourishment that we eat. So what we put into our mouth, what we feed ourselves and deliver those to all of our cells and all of our organs and therefore shapes our lives. So that's really where I started from. And how I got into um, food as medicine is quite simple. Uh, I uh, started a nonprofit organization called the Angiogenesis Foundation. Uh, anybody can find it. It's A-N-G-I-O, angio.org, O-R-G. It's the only angiogenesis foundation that's in existence. <clears throat> we set ourselves almost 30 years ago to try to propel this science to help change people's lives, improve people's lives by tackling diseases that were previously considered unbeatable, wounds that don't heal with diabetes or obesity or in the elderly, you know, from nursing homes, um, vision lost from uh, uh, being elderly or from diabetes, for example, um, cancer, uh, you know, largely until recently, uh, you know, sort of this, uh, uh, this threat to our existence that we really didn't know how to um, punch our way out of the box. So we were very successful in not only mastering the science, but also coordinating uh, the laboratories, the biotech companies, the investors, the clinicians to do the research, the regulators, the insurance companies, the medical associations, the public and the media, really a 360 degree um, uh, uh, realm of activity. Uh, we were successful in, as of last count, uh, we've, we've helped to, to um, bring about 44 new treatments for these terrible conditions. So, um, sort of as an achievement, it's, I think, something I'm very proud of, uh, uh, you know, running a nonprofit, a charity. Now, that in this experience, what I realized was that um, there was a, 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 a drug development is a really long-term 
uh, process. 10 years, very expensive. In the United States and in Europe, it can cost over a billion dollars over a decade to succeed. And the odds of failure are huge. Um, and yet when we have a home run, when we have a winner, like new immunotherapies for cancer, for example, or a growth factor therapy that can heal a diabetic wound to save a limb so you can avoid amputation, just some examples, or something that can reverse blindness, stop blindness and reverse it to restore vision. These are um, miraculous uh, achievements, advances, but they're hard won and they take a long time and they're anything but immediate. Mm -hmm. What I realize is the same science that we use for drug development, the same science, we could apply that same science to food. Now, of course, in Asia, uh, food and medicine have gone hand in hand, whether you're talking about Ayurvedic medicine in India, whether you're talking about traditional Chinese medicine in China, you know, and all the other Asian countries where um, what we have in our marketplace and what we have in herbal stores um, and the doctors, you know, that are incented to keep us well, as opposed to only treat disease, which is the paradigm in the, in the West, you know, in, in, in modernized Western countries. It's a completely different paradigm. What I realized is that we could take these same foods and herbs um, and, and, uh, and traditional medicines, and we could test them in the same systems that we do modern drugs. And that was the breakthrough for me. About 15 years ago, I started to test drugs, but also throw foods into the same system just to see what would happen, right? So, you know, it, it, of course, we kept it a secret in the beginning because it was just, I wouldn't say for fun. We did it for really with seriousness of purpose, mm -hmm. but we did not know what we would find. And what we did find is that 50% or more of the foods that we tested had equal or better potency than the drugs that we have been actively developing. And so to me, that was the evidence, the science behind food as medicine. And I haven't looked back since. We've just gone on there to dig further. And I would say I've combined um, my, uh, my scientific and clinical insights. Uh, I, I put that together really with my own passion for delicious foods and my respect for the cultures from which these foods have come. Wow. But doctor, you know, I have a genuine, you know, thought about this. Today, when you look on yeah. social media, when you look at, you know, all the different platforms that are just spewing out content, some of them cherry pick science, take this out there. How, what's your dream to take the science like to such a level, your book or whatever you have in your concept, which makes absolutely, you know, complete sense at a physical level at a molecular level for nutrition. Like I know you must be thinking because I know you must be seeing all the stuff on social media that says no fruits at all, no this, no that. And you're missing out on the medicine that exists on all of this. I understand bio-individuality. Like if I had a fatty liver patient, grade three to cirrhotic, I would stop fruits for a while, but it doesn't mean mm -hmm. everyone has to. So <laughs> it's just curious. I know I'm going off topic right now, but what do you have in your mind? Like how do you, what's your plan to make this reach mainstream? Like, like everyone should know that, hey, there are foods for this, for all of that, because, you know, I just, I'm just curious to know what your dream is. Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, as you say dream, what my vision, what my vision actually is, is that, um, that the science and the art and the history of food can really help to reshape the culture of global food. And I think that is a big goal because this goes from the individual, the family, the community that actually has to buy from the market or the grocery store, bring it home, make a decision, cook their food, decide what they want to eat today and tomorrow and the next day, or entertain their friends to restaurant owners who are actually creating menus. Um, you know, right now it's really about creativity and what will sell and, and, and showcasing the skills of the chef or the cuisine, uh, the, the attributes of the cuisine. But, you know, there's a new layer you can add on to it. And it's also that healthful aspect, which I think is a selling point. I think to be able to actually showcase this food aspect as something um, advantageous, advantageous to the individual, individual health, community health, um, good for the bottom line. If you're a restaurateur, uh, if you are a grocer and you are able to actually sell more 
of something that's good for the community. I think there's an ethical benefit for that. Um, I mean, there's a human moral benefit, an ethical benefit, societal benefit. But I also think if we can make it count for the bottom line, and that is actually going to incent business. And any place where people need to make money, including farmers and food companies uh, and media people, I think that we you know, need to share the same uh, language. Mm-hmm. So you bring up something very interesting, which is we are at this, um, I would say, a wonderful and overwhelming period of communications today, uh, you know, in the second decade of the 21st century, where we have this thing called Internet and social media. Mm-hmm. Anybody with Internet connection can download an app and become a voice. I actually think that there's something wonderful about that opportunity. It democratizes our ability to speak to our fellow human. Mm-hmm. Now, the price to pay for that is really um, uh, having with many voices um, the the uh, uh, the confusion that can result when there's too many people saying things all at once. Ultimately, however, you know, really, this is where science, I think, delivers over and over again, time and time and again. History has shown us. What's true is shown by science, continues to be true, regardless of what other people say. And what's nice about science is it moves forward. It continuously changes. So something we think we know today is going to evolve tomorrow. I know one of the things that you're eager to talk about is um, how some of the mythology of food, uh, including modern mythology, urban legend, I call it, um, you know, don't eat this, don't eat that, this food is harmful for you. In fact, as the science is being done, it overturns those myths. So we not certain about a food. Now the science says it's completely safe to eat and it's delicious because cultures have been doing it for thousands, tens of thousands of years. This is actually my vision is that we can have scalable impact where um, something that uh, a a fellow uh, foodist medicine researcher tells me, I will then tell you, you will tell the people who follow you and so on and so forth. This is not a religion. It's not a cult. It is a statement of fact, but it's wrapped in something that is delicious, easy to actually um, integrate into your life, and ideally connected to the cultures, plural, from which we all come. Wow. I love your vision. And if there's anything I can do to support your vision in any way, you know, I'm in for that because You know, I'll give you an example. You know, when we used to try to encourage our patients of cancer or diabetes or cardiovascular issues to eat particular foods, like your book states, we realized that when I understood how you explained angiogenesis, and the moment I stopped from telling a patient that you need to eat this food, but I explained the way you explained and taught me about angiogenesis, it was immediate shift. And so with understanding, people started to change their lifestyle. Yeah. Because what we hear about is the what. Yeah. Eat this, don't eat that, do this, don't do that. And, uh, in, you know, there's so many instructions uh, and ideas that are out there. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm being fair because I think that in this world of social media, there's good information and there's less good information and there's bad information. It's all information. But the, if you only know the what, you get it's easy to get confused. Once you know the why, yeah. now that one additional piece gives you the power that, that it empowers you to actually take that action. Because understanding is really how I think we as humans navigate our lives. Absolutely. And I think both your books, which are going to be in the show notes, explains the why. And that's why I could understand and relate it. And not just categorize it as a book where, oh, no, someone's put food, some signs, some links, which no one really go into. But the why made absolute sense. So, doctor, I want to talk about your five protocols, which has become the fundamental, literally the fundamental platform of every disease that we treat, which is angiogenesis, DNA, microbiome, immunity, and of course, stem cells. That was my favorite chapter because we were never taught to believe. We were always taught to believe stem cells is going to be you know, injected into you and all of that stuff. And when I saw the foods and how you explained the connection with our own body's ability to regenerate stem cells, like that was wow. So I would love for you to take, how did you arrive at these five 
you know, mechanisms which have now become the fundamentals of literally integrative and lifestyle medicine. Okay, so these five systems that you're talking about, um, I uh, there are body's health defense systems. They're hardwired. This is how we are designed. You mm-hmm. know, our creator designed us with this. And in fact, these health defense systems were formed when we were still in our mother's womb. Mm-hmm. And so they go way, way back. But I want to kind of tell you how I came at this. Yeah. So I went to medical school um, and, uh, in, and throughout my education, in mm-hmm. which I learned almost nothing about nutrition and nothing about health, I was spent week after week after week being taught by my professors about disease. This is cancer. This is diabetes. This is obesity. This is Alzheimer's disease. This is arthritis. This is psoriasis, so on and so forth. Uh, Or this is a bacteria that's harmful. Uh, You must kill this bacteria because it's terrible. And so my head became um, uh, really overflowing with information about disease. Now, this is what every doctor goes through um, uh, in Western medicine, medical practice. You just memorize lots of things. And I got to a point where, uh, you know, maybe in my third year of medical school, I, I began to push back against my professors to say, okay, okay, I know this, I understand, I'm going to study some more about brain cancer, or I'm going to study some more about um, uh, 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 inflammatory bowel disease, okay, or autoimmunity. Um, so I understand the disease, I will understand the disease, but tell me what is health? I'm spending all this time studying disease. What is health? Because, um, and, and my professors would look at me and to, you know, kind of um, shake their head. And they would say, you know, young, you young doctor, you, you know, it's, it's just, you're asking us a foolish question. Health is simply the absence of disease. If you're not sick, you're healthy. And I was never satisfied with that answer. I thought, you know, most of us are pretty healthy most of our lives. And then we get struck down like an arrow that gets sent into our back, right? I mean, whether it's a flu or a cold or something more serious, um, and we never know why that happens. Like, and so, you know, as I became a doctor and I was taking care of cancer patients, um, uh, uh, the question that people always ask is, Dr. Lee, why did I get colon cancer? Why did I get breast cancer? Why did I get lung cancer? I never smoked cigarettes. And you know what was interesting? I would, of course, try to answer them with the usual answer based on modern Western medical teaching. But I, in my back of my head, I started realizing the more important, profound question is, and I asked myself this, not why did we get cancer, but why, did we not get, why do we not get cancer more often? Why do we not get heart disease more often? Why doesn't everybody have diabetes from the time they're children? Why don't we actually have Alzheimer's disease from the time we were teenagers, you know? And so these types of questions made me realize how much we don't know about health itself. And this is a question I started asking almost 30 years ago. So I mentioned to you that in my work as a nonprofit and in the nonprofit, the Angiogenesis Foundation, we dove into developing treatments to improve blood vessels. We dove into treatments to actually use stem cells to heal the brain, heal the heart, heal the spinal cord. We dove into treatments to heal the gut, the gut microbiome. We drove into, we did use gene therapy. This is all biotech. We looked at immunotherapy um, to try to improve the immune system or to calm inflammation. All of these things are in some ways, they're all connected together uh, for drugs, for drug development. And I realized If you just flip the script away from looking at these systems as a problem of disease or a solution to disease, but you look at them from the other way, which is what do these systems do for health? All of a sudden, it became crystal clear to me, uh, Luke, that these five systems, angiogenesis, stem cells in our body, our gut microbiome, uh, our DNA, uh, our genes and our immune system, which controls inflammation as well as defensive immunity, they defend our health. Our health is not just the absence of disease. It's the result of these five systems that are firing powerfully uh, as hard as they can from the day we're born and doing this until we take our last breath. And failures of these systems that can occur for many, many different reasons um, is what actually leads to the disease coming in. So a health defense system is like having a fence outside of your home to prevent 
the bad guys, the robbers, the rioters from coming into your property and invading your home. When your fence is unlocked or weakened or, uh, or comes down because a storm has blown down your fence, it become, you become much more vulnerable to the attack. So health defense, like any other defense, is a shield. And what I realized is that uh, with my work in drugs, we can certainly treat these, use drugs to treat these systems. But the remarkable thing is that foods contain natural substances. Um, you know, um, I, I think, you know, if you look at uh, Ayurvedic medicine, if you look at traditional Chinese medicine, um, uh, other medicines of, of Southeast Asia, for example, they've known for years that, the, that foods have healthful properties. Now our modern molecular science nails down what is beginning to identify exactly what these um, substances are at the molecular level and how our body responds to them. And so now this is wonderful opportunity to activate our health defenses using our diet. Wow. I remember I was stuck on a particular case. It was a young girl who had psoriasis and she had the patches all over. And I was exploring the VGF, the vascular endothelial growth factor. Mm -hmm. And I was just studying, and then I came across angiogenesis, Googled it further, came to your work, your page, and I said, I need to get into detail. And the way you explain how an anti-angiogenic food protocol could help with this, because you had all the blood vessels just growing out of control, that case had a turnaround in three weeks just by incorporating the foods. And that was a learning for us. And of course, autoimmune is something that you look from inside, the anxiety of the child and so many other things. Yeah. But yeah. just putting an anti-angiogenic yeah. protocol in that girl's diet, it was like a miracle. And I know well, that, this is... that was the only change we made. We were still struggling. She was getting the patches. It's easy to blame it on stress, anxiety. And then, you know, when you've changed something and you get a result, you, you know what's kind of worked for it. And that was the only thing we changed, doctor. Well, I, you know, I... Um, congratulate you for helping that individual. And of course, what happens is that once we try a concept and put it into practice, so I call it principles to practice, then it gives you the encouragement, the confidence, and it empowers you to try it again and find different situations where they can actually improve your life. So again, part of my vision is really, this is all about trying to scale out the impact of what scientific facts is generating about our food substances. Um, you know, I teach a master class. I've had people from India, from Australia, from all the continents, actually, um, except Antarctica so far, um, uh, join me uh, on my master classes. They're completely free. I try to give people the basics. Uh, I do this every month or so. I try to give people the basics to, to, to get interested so they can, as you say, do some more research to look into it themselves. And then the other thing I, I really believe in, because I come from a teaching family, both of my parents were professors. And I, I, I myself taught at medical schools and at, at colleges before. I really believe that if you can teach an individual something that they can do for themselves, the what and the why, and then the how, the how is also important, right? Uh, eat this, why? Because it does this to help you. All right, now how do I do it? So I, I developed this online course that now has almost 4,000 people from 34 countries. It's only about a year and a half old or so. Um, but, but again, to me, that's, a, that's how I see my global impact actually happening. So many people are just out there, you know, I think on social media to get attention. For me, mm -hmm. I'm out there and teaching these courses, online courses that anybody can sign up to in order to have impact. I never miss your post on Instagram when you're in a supermarket. I'm like, oh, what's doctor going to talk about today? And some some new vegetable, which I've never probably seen. I look forward to that. That's great stuff, doctor. And and by the way, you know, this past summer, uh, you know, I'm somebody. So first of all, I'm trained as an internal medicine doctor. So uh, like I, I have the capability of running an intensive care unit or an emergency room. And that puts makes me a little bit different than a family care, family practice or GP who really sees well patients most of the time. I can handle very, very difficult cases. And in fact, that's really one of the things that my specialty is in really working on the unsolvable case. Um, uh, uh, but the other thing that uh, I, I do is that's different is that I enjoy food. I like to cook. And so I, and, and I'm also a researcher, so I actually do the research. So um, for me, uh, uh, I like to walk the talk 
you know, what I say and say, and I continue to do research. So this, for example, this past summer, I went to the Mediterranean and, and I literally was in the marketplace um, looking at and discovering new foods and doing the work, the research to figure out what was in. I discovered, for example, in the cantaloupe, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the orange sweet melon uh, that's, that, that is found almost everywhere, some version of the cantaloupe. There's a new bioactive. I wasn't aware of It's not in my book, but I'm now talking about it. It's called amentoflavone. And the mental flavone helps improve the health of our circulation. It improves mm-hmm. our angiogenesis system so that we have better blood flow to our brain, to our heart, to our muscles, helps with healthy aging. And, uh, you know, it's just an openness of new door. So this is an example where, you know, um, for me, food as medicine is not just copying what other people are saying and trying to get attention. I want people to be empowered to understand what's new and how they can change their own lives and enjoy their uh, taste at the same time. Yeah, I love your recipes. Your book is filled with amazing recipes, easy to make and really fascinating stuff. So I can see your passion around the recipe. So you've written those recipes yourself. You've actually come up. Oh, with yeah. Recipes. Wow. Yeah. And I and, and I cook them. I mean, these are many of the recipes are the things that I, you know, I pulled out of my own notebook in my kitchen. Uh, and, and I'm always learning something else, new, new things all the time, new recipes. But I will tell you, so my, my approach to eating might also be um, refreshing and fun for your audience to hear is people always ask me, Dr. Lee, what do you eat yourself, right? Like, what do you eat? So in my online course, I do have a whole module in which I, it's called What Dr. Lee Eats. But I have a, um, a, another way of explaining it, which is that uh, my, very simple, My approach to eating is not a diet. I don't believe in diets because everybody is a little bit different, but I have a style, a way, a method of approaching food. And I call it the Mediterranean style approach to eating. Mediterranean, Asia, these are vast areas, including more than 20 countries apiece, okay, um, geographically, that are known to have some of the healthiest communities pockets of the healthiest communities in the world. Now, those healthiest communities, interestingly, eat very traditional foods. Their recipes, their food practices, their food patterns tend to veer and stay grounded in what they, they, our, our ancestors um, ate, if you're from the Mediterranean, if you're from Asia, what the ancestors ate. And of course, you know, back in you go back a thousand years or more, Asia is very old, um, older than the Mediterranean, in fact, um, you know, people learn from experience. And so, and the combinations of things. So people now talk about, oh, there's food inequities for healthy food. Poor people who are poor cannot afford the healthiest food. That's true in the West, more so in the West. Okay, but I can tell you, you go to some of the poorest areas of Asia, some of the poorest areas of Europe, in fact, you know, some of the in the Mediterranean, you go to Spain, you go to Italy, you go to Morocco, you know, or you go to Egypt. There's a lot of people who do not make a lot of money, okay? Mm-hmm. They go to their traditional recipes to have their whole grains, their spices, their seasonal available fruits and vegetables, and they cook them in very traditional ways. And it turns out we're discovering those are, in fact, some of the healthiest um, foods around. So I like to cook. I like to learn from the past, from the traditions. And I think that if we now spend time, not just inventing new technologies for food, I mean, I think that I celebrate that as well, but I think there's something even more grounded that everyone can access if you go back to look at some of the old ways and to understand why they were actually so good for so long. Right, no, I appreciate that point. You know, it was in the lockdown during the pandemic, uh, I published a book called Back to Roots. And this was born out of the fact that I was called to evaluate a particular village in northern India, a very poor village. And they were having issues with the kidney and liver. And so they figured like, hey, Luke, can you come and look at lifestyle and nutrition? And I came back learning that they were eating healthier than most other states. They were using moringa leaves. They had high iron, naturally cooking an iron, wood fire, sand. And I was like, there isn't a problem. The problem was finally determined with the water the water supply, interesting the food. And then I realized that in the, some of the poorest villages across the country, exactly like you said, they're using traditional ways of cooking, utensils, and the simplest ingredients, the simplest ingredients. And today that's what our richest clients are now eating. 
literally. Yeah. The well, and listen, I, and, I, and I think that you're getting onto something that I'm very passionate about, which is that um, there's the food, there's a simplicity of traditional ingredients um, that grown, you know, in the land around us. <clears throat> but also there is the way that we eat because in traditional societies, people don't grab something in a plastic bag that you throw on the street and then just run, you know, while we're actually eating on the run, okay, in a car or, you know, whatever, your bicycle, or whatever you're actually doing. The, the reality is, is that traditional societies that eat this way, they eat with other people. Mm -hmm. We eat meals together. We celebrate the community. Our food is part of our humanity, part of our community. And, and in this part of community, I mean, if you think about it, okay, a modern city like New York City, London, uh, Milan, you know, what do people do? Uh, maybe not Milan, but like London or, 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 or Washington, D.C. or New York City. You get people together. But often they're eating alone mm -hmm. quickly in order to be able to go do, back to work, which is stressful. OK, and stress also degrades your health defenses. You eat alone. You eat quickly. You want to eat cheap, fast food, which is already a setup for uh, an unhealthy pattern of eating if you would do it in day in and day out. Now you're um, uh, you're not eating you're not eating with somebody else. You're eating quickly, so you tend to overeat. Now, if you eat with other people, and of course I'm there. Are, this is a generalization, but if you eat with other people, you're talking about your problems. You're talking about your business. You're talking about all the worries of of what's going on. Okay, maybe you're you know, what happens in traditional societies, right? I mean, maybe these villages that you went to or the Mediterranean places I was doing research on, when people to get together, the meal is a sacred ritual. And regardless of the problems that we are all individually facing in our own lives, you sit down together and you take a break in order to be able to enjoy that meal together, which lowers stress. What do you talk about? You don't talk about your business. You talk about, oftentimes, you talk about the food. This is great. This is the ingredient I'm so grateful for. My mother used to make it this way. This is what I appreciate. This is how, how I cook it, right? I mean, you probably you're nodding, so I know that you. you this is something that you uh, you connect to. This is a part of the value of eating. Is not just only the food ingredient or the food preparation, but the way that we consume it. All of which lowers stress, builds community bonds, and ultimately helps us live longer, healthier and more vital lives. No, oh, that, that's beautiful. And I love I love the fact that you just don't talk about science, but you bring all of these, you know, finer and more subtle parts of lifestyle to integrate, like the why. You've just given us the why of, you know, what you said, which is beautiful. Doctor, you know, when it comes to cancer, there's chemotherapy, right? radiation, immunotherapy, surgery, respect all of that. And then you speak about eating to starve cancer, which was absolutely brilliant. I would love for you to touch upon that topic on eating to starve cancer. Yeah. Okay. So cancer is that one disease that when you hear that word, it sends a, a shiver down everyone's spine. It is a instant kind of life changer to receive that diagnosis until now, because then science now teaches us how to look at the situation of cancer quite differently. First of all, cancer is really just our, one of our cells that from some organ that's become abnormal and it's mutated. And a lot of people don't realize this, but you know, we have about 40 trillion cells in our body. We're made out of a lot of cells, okay? And when our cells uh, replicate, they have to copy each other so that we're, this is why we're still here today and not gone yesterday. And this is why we'll still be here tomorrow because our cells will reproduce themselves, okay? Um, uh, and when our cells uh, reproduce, it's easy to make mistakes. If, for example, copying is not that easy when you do it in a large level. Mm -hmm. If I gave you a sentence to write on a piece of paper or a laptop to type out, and I gave you one sentence and I said, um, Luke, can you copy this 10 times? You'll do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. If I said, Luke, can you copy it 100 times? You'll probably make one or two mistakes at least. OK, it, but then if I if I asked you like the body does, Luke, can you copy this 40 trillion times? I guarantee you, you'll make many, many mistakes. It's just how it is. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but our body's uh, DNA, when it copies itself, naturally makes 10,000 mistakes every single day, every 24 hours, 
each of these mistakes, 10,000 mistakes, can become a microscopic cancer. So we're all walking around with little microscopic cancers in our body. They'll never become dangerous. They exist inside us, even as children, okay? But the reason that they can't harm us is because our defenses, our body defenses are, are, are working, okay? They don't have a blood supply, so they can't grow large. Uh, 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 our, um, our gut health, our microbiome lowers inflammation and inflammation is a trigger for cancers to grow faster. Um, uh, our DNA is protected uh, from the inside, uh, tries to protect itself. It can be improved with food. Um, so it prevents more mutations from growing around that first mutation. And uh, again, our immune system is really kind of a, like a police force in our body. Um, parts of our immune system uh, conducts surveillance. They just drive through our bloodstream like the police officers in a, in a neighborhood looking for a problem. And when they see those microscopic cancers, your immune system will just take them out, put them in the back of the police car, take them away and dispose of them, okay? So this is how it keeps the body clean all the time. When we develop a cancer, something goes wrong with that defense system, okay? And number one, going to angiogenesis is, suddenly the tumor is able to grow because it has been able to hijack angiogenesis that hijacks the ability of your body to grow blood vessels. In fact, it selfishly grows blood vessels to itself. All right. And once the cancer um, um, uh, develops its own blood supply, man, that is actually bringing oxygen and nutrients to the tumor. In fact, I worked in a laboratory where this was actually proven that if you took a tumor and you, um, a, a small um, nest, a small uh, nugget of cancer cells and prevented blood vessels from growing, they would actually never grow in the laboratory. They would just never get big, just waiting to be taken out like garbage, all right? But the moment you actually, if you grew blood vessels to them, once the blood vessels touch the cancer, the microscopic cancer, that microscopic cancer would explode in its growth. In fact, it would grow 16,000 times in size in just two weeks because it's being fed. So. One of the big breakthroughs that my group has made is this discovery that you can actually cut off the blood supply of feeding cancers using foods that naturally contain substances that inhibit angiogenesis. What are some of those foods? Berries, strawberries have elagic acid, blueberries have anthocyanin, um, uh, uh, fruits, uh, peaches uh, have chlorogenic acid, and so do apples. Uh, vegetables like broccoli have uh, sulforaphanes, isothiocyanates. So again, we're starting to categorize these foods and what they contain, and many of them can cut off the blood supply, the tumor. Tea, not just green tea. Green tea has catechins, um, but black tea, fermented teas also have it. If you go a very fermented tea, guess what? Now you have a micro, uh, now you have a probiotic tea because it has its own bacteria that you can sip. And think about the traditional Asian teas that are highly fermented, they're digestives. They're actually probiotics, they activate your uh, gut microbiome and it lowers inflammation. Inflammation triggers blood vessels to grow into the cancer. So, so you can not only directly cut off the blood supply feeding a cancer, you can also lower inflammation so you can put out the fire that's trying to make these cancers grow faster to feed them. So this is just one dimension of how foods can activate our body's health defenses, giving us the power to be able to have a tool in the toolbox that your doctor doesn't have to prescribe. No, oh, that's beautiful. And as I read through your first book and finished chapter by chapter, angiogenesis, DNA, and I looked at your food charts, and then you know my mind was moving forward like, hey, now how am I gonna find common foods that can hit all the defense mechanisms? And you had mm. the chart and the brilliance of that chart was the foods that you just mentioned were common at every level all the five mechanisms. And then my next thought was, okay, if I'm doing anti-angiogenic, and what happens if I need foods which are, you know, angiogenic? Will they conflict? Yeah. And then you had the foods and the signs showing that it has absolutely no correlation of causing, you know, the opposite. And that, that was fascinating. Well, yeah, well, let me let me explain that for, for people. So yeah. there, are, there are foods that you can actually use to prevent excess blood vessels from growing into cancer, as an example. They're all, or in the eye. OK, uh, or in the plaques of under the plaques of psoriasis, there are also foods that can help grow useful 
beneficial blood vessels where you don't have enough, like in diabetes. Oftentimes, people with diabetes have wounds that are very difficult to heal, not enough blood vessels, or in the heart. They don't have enough blood supply, um, so they have a heart attack. Now you need to actually grow more blood vessels to feed the heart or the brain after a stroke or to prevent a stroke. Now, so there are foods that can actually grow blood vessels uh, as well. So the logical question is, well, will the anti-androgenic um, uh, food uh, cause a problem for my heart or my brain? Um, and will the pro-androgenic food that grows blood vessels trigger tumors to grow? Look, the answer is no. And the wonderful reason why it's no is our body is in command. Our body knows that foods could be titrated to give us just the right amount at all times. So in other words, um, there is a what I call the uh, a zone of natural health defense for androgenesis. Uh, and it's kind of like that, that, that fairy tale, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, if you, if you heard of that, where there's three bears that find a, a home in the forest and uh, there's nobody home and they're trying to look for the perfect thing. You know, they want a chair that's not too hard and not, uh, not too soft to sit on, a bed that's not too hard or not too soft, a, a porridge that's not too hot or not too cold, but just right. And so what, what I call it in the book is the Goldilocks zone is that perfect zone for health defense where our body knows how to titrate the food to just give us what we need. It never, it gets rid of anything that's extra. So we only have that perfect amount. Now, this is different, by the way. Food can do this in a way that drugs can't. Drugs are like putting a, a missile into a, a fighter jet and launching it into the system. Because I've been involved with it, developing the drugs. I know the drugs can overshoot very easily because they're synthetic, man-made. They're super powerful at concentrations, tens of thousands uh, of times of what foods can actually do. Foods are our kinder, gentler way of helping our body keep balance. Wow. Doctor, since we're talking about cancer, I was amazed with your piece of research on soy. And that's continued to be like, you know, social media thrashes it. It's very rare. And even if someone wants to talk about it very positively, it gets kind of pulled down. I'm a huge believer of the science of soy. We've seen it work with premenopausal women. Of course, the quality, it's got to be non-GMO. And for triple negative breast cancers, you know, where there's nothing much that you can do and there's a drug that's just trying to shut down angiogenesis at every level. I would love for you to explain to us your science on soy. I like how you spoke about genistein and all of these isoflavins that can actually be used, but people are yeah. not using it out of fear. And sometimes that's the only thing that I feel the patient needs at that point that can really get the intelligence system working. I would love for you to explain. Oh, okay, well, let's, 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 let's talk a little bit about... Um soy and cancer and how they, they even started to become connected from the popular um, perspective. And even doctors sometimes propagate this wrong idea that soy is dangerous for many cancers, especially breast cancer. So <clears throat> soy contains a natural substance called genistein. Okay. Genistein is known as a phyto or plant, phyto, plant estrogen. And somebody who is probably 10 or 15 years ago, who was very well-intentioned. I like to give people credit. You know, well-intentioned people uh, came up with these ideas. They saw that as we began to realize that some breast cancers are very sensitive to human estrogen, that, oh my gosh, well, the plant has estrogen um, and, and breast cancers have estrogen, must stay away from all soy. But, uh, and so this has now become propagated in the popular lore Women should be afraid of soy, stay away from soy because it's got estrogen, it could provoke breast cancer, completely based on urban legend, completely not true. Let me tell you, because I did the research myself. We looked at genistein and we put it genistein into the system to look at angiogenesis, just completely open-minded to see what would happen. Uh, would it grow blood vessels? Would it stop blood vessels? What would actually happen? I can tell you that soy... Genistein, genistein derived from soybeans, soybeans, tofu, soy milk, fermented soy products, any kind of soy. Tempeh as well, a, right? Tempeh would come. What's that? Way. And tempeh, tempeh in that as well um, okay. as a powerful inhibitor, <laughs> suppressor of angiogenesis. It really starves cancer, really in a massive way. Okay, and so we know that it, it, it's beneficial to fight cancer, not to be a risk for cancer. So. 
how did this misunderstanding uh, took, take place? Again, I, I'm a scientist. So if you look at the, um, the, the chemical structure of estrogen, human estrogen, that is dangerous for some forms of breast cancer, and you draw that, or you look a picture, look a picture on it, go ahead and go to Google and look up the image of the picture of human estrogen in breast cancer, to show you a picture of it, then go to genistein, okay? And look at that image, okay? And you look at them, they, they don't look the same. The plant estrogen looks nothing like human estrogen. And in fact, it's now been shown that the plant estrogen blocks human estrogen. So soy-based estro- uh, um, genistein is in fact like mother nature's tamoxifen. You know, we prescribe tamoxifen to block estrogen in women who um, uh, have breast cancer and don't want to, and for it does not to come back, Mother Nature's already packaged this kind of an approach already in soy. All right, you say, well, that's nice, Dr. Lee, that's a theory, maybe it's some chemical structures, but you know, tell me if it really works in women. So there was a paper that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's a very, very prestigious, very difficult to publish, um, evidence-based um, uh, medical journal. And it's called the Shanghai Breast Cancer uh, Research Study. They, this group studied 5,000 women who were at the highest risk for breast cancer, highest risk. And you know who those women are? They're women who already have breast cancer, mm. already have breast cancer. And what they did is they tracked the amount of soy that they were eating. And here's what they found over five years. Those women who ate the most soy-based foods, the most had a 30% decrease in their risk of death from breast cancer. Death, that's a hard endpoint. Those women whose breast cancers had been removed by surgery or they were in remission, they had almost a 30% risk, lower risk of having the cancer come back. And the amount of soy that you needed to get to this threshold is not that much. It's about 10 grams of soy protein a day. How much is that? Well, if you equate that to soy milk, that's just one tall glass of soy milk per day. So you don't need very much. You don't have to go, this is natural. You can integrate this into your lives. <clears throat> and subsequently, there've been many other studies that are really pretty much disproven that eating soy actually causes harm. If you go back 20 years, 30 years before this urban legend came out, all right, I can tell you in Asia, uh, throughout Asia, Uh, I can speak for Japan and China. If you had breast cancer, the traditional doctors didn't tell you to eat less soy or avoid soy. They told you to eat more of it. So again, somehow, you know, there's these truths that are semi-truths that get distorted by interpretations that are well-meaning, but not accurate. Okay. And then it gets out, out there and then it spreads like wildfire. So part of my mission is really to be able to do the research to be able to spread the information on the truth, to help clear up confusion, and then allow people to make up their own minds. Maybe you like soy. Now is the permission to eat it. Maybe you don't like it. Then then stay away from it. There's something else you can eat as well. Yeah. No, that's amazing. And of course, then there's non-GMO and there's GMO, and it's obvious that you would definitely... GMO could kind of mess things up, not just, you know, at a cellular level, right? So so I I will tell you, I uh, I was moderating a panel of experts just yesterday, uh, a food and nutrition innovation conference. And we were talking about childhood health and nutrition and diet. And one of the panelists is a researcher on food allergies. And what she said was that what we're beginning to realize is that with all the genetically modified foods to make the foods taste better, the grains, you know, um, uh, get better mouthfeel, better, sweeter flavor, we're modifying what mother nature actually has in a way that used to be training the more natural versions from the past. We're training our gut and training our gut microbiome and training our immune system to respond appropriately. And, you know, I, I was always for years, I was, this began to change my mind about GMO because for years I said, you know, I don't know what the evidence is. And, and yesterday, one of the clear points was made is, you know, globally, there's a remarkable rise in food allergies, right? People are now allergic to peanuts. They're allergic to all kinds of things, gluten. What's going on, right? When we were young children, we didn't see this epidemic of food allergies. And the point was made that among other additives, 
uh, one of the changes in our natural food supply that is affecting our gut and our gut microbiome, one of our health defenses, are the subtle changes that have been genetically modified, well-intentioned by the company to sell more product or maybe make taste a little bit but more, um, more, make you more avid and enthusiastic for the product. We're removing the training that our gut needs to be able to help our health defenses protect us. And so then we become more vulnerable. Amazing to think about. So I think this now gives us pause, reason to have pause about this whole GMO story. Well, thanks for clearing that up, Doctor. I could go on talking to you for hours. I want to be mindful of your time. But I also want to know, you know, with the kind of schedule you have, you're seeing difficult patients, you're working on research, you have this noble mission of driving your vision. How do you manage day-to-day -day stress, anxiety, tough times? What, what are your coping mechanisms? Because, you know, there are doctors, there are pilots, nutritionists, all, all fields of different, you know, professions that handle it in different ways. And a lot of people like to assume, I'm a doctor, I'm always going to be busy and stressed. But then there are doctors who do it the right way and doctors who can do it better. Likewise, whatever, every other profession. What are some of your mechanisms that you use? Yeah, well, you know, I will tell you that I have to work very hard uh, at self-care and to monitor the amount of stress that I have. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I think it's all, it's true that stress can be very bad for you. But it's also true that a little bit of stress actually can be healthy for you as well. So, you know, just like anything else, when it comes to a balanced lifestyle, we don't want to um, uh, over assign a negative characteristic to anything. But I think moderating your stress is very important. Some of the things that I honestly, when I think at the base of what two things I try to do, three things I try to do um, on a regular basis. Number one, I do try to get enough sleep. I don't always, I'm always on the, I'm often on the move. So I don't always have time to get as much sleep as I would like, but every moment that I can actually get a good amount of sleep, I know that that sleep, even though I'm not physically active when I'm sleeping, I know that the biology in my body, my health defenses are very active in repairing and fixing and raising the shields um, and helping my metabolism groom, burning down extra body fat, all of those things that I want to have, repairing my brain. You know, there's this... Uh, hidden sewer system in our brain called the glymphatic channels, only discovered within the last 10 years or so. We didn't even know it existed until recently because when, you know, when you're awake during the day, it's closed. It's like a hidden system, okay? And when they do autopsies to do research, you know, pathology lab, people are dead, they're shut, they're not open. But we now know because we have the research tools that when you're sleeping, there's an entire sewer system that opens up in our brain called the glymphatic channels and good quality sleep. Okay. Where we're dreaming and we're really deep in sleep, restorative sleep, those channels open up and they drain the toxins that have accumulated over the last waking period of our day. So we drain toxins from our brain when we get good sleep, which of course allows us to actually um, feel more rested and also helps lower the amount of stress that we have the next day where we, so I do, I try to get enough sleep. Number two, um, I do try to enjoy the food that I eat. I, I look at every meal as a shot on goal. I have an opportunity to score a goal, but I, I don't think about it just for my health. I think about like, what do I enjoy eating? What would I enjoy eating? And by the way, if I, cause I travel a lot, if we're at any point in time, wherever I am, uh, I can find something good. I will eat it. If I, with the restaurant, it's a, a, a market, um, I'm at somebody's house, but guess what? If at any point in time, I cannot find something that's healthy, I will sometimes skip a meal. I don't need to eat three times a day like a robot, okay? Um, I, I view my body as a temple, and so I want to take good care of it. I will not compromise the sanctity of my biology by just eating junk because that's what's around, okay? So I will take extra pains um, to, to eat foods. That I, and of course, I enjoy the pleasure of food and I like to cook. So if I can make something that I find absolutely delicious, I will go out of my way to make something, create something that I enjoy. And it's very satisfying for me to actually make it. So eating. Third thing that I try to do is I try to stay physically active. Physical activity goes hand in hand with eating. You want to burn down the fuel that you put in your body. Okay, increase improves your metabolism, your insulin, your glucose, or fat hormones, everything is interconnected. 
And um, staying physically active is also connected to sleep as well. When you're more physically active, you sleep better as well. So these are sort of the three legs of the stool. And I would I just add one more fourth leg is that I try to stay in touch with people who I'm close to um, to really help me manage my stress. You know, I call up a friend, uh, check in with them. We have a laugh. We share a story. I always feel better uh, from, from doing that. And I'm a big believer that, you know, if you give to somebody, you try to help somebody, it actually, you're paying it forward. It also is a way for me to manage my stress. And so these are some ways that I go about my uh, crazy, busy life um, managing things. But I wouldn't trade, you know, the stress I do have uh, for just a completely chill, laid back, you know, uh, at the beach life, you know, uh, all, all year. I would never do that. I, 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 I'm actually very energized by my mission. Uh, uh, so that makes it very important for me to also manage myself. And that's why I started off by saying it's a um, continuous attention to self-care. That's amazing. I think that brings out the uh, importance of purpose as well. You're so purpose-driven in every aspect of your life. You know, Doctor, I think it would take a whole other podcast, which I hope to get with you at some point, to talk about your second book, because I didn't have a chance to talk about how beautifully you brought out brown fat, white fat, and the mechanisms that converted. I thought that was brilliant, and I don't want to rush that question. I'm going to visualize more time with you in the future. But before we end Happy this, to do it. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Before, before we end this, if you had everyone in the world watching you right now for a message, what would that message be? It could be anything. Like, what do you think the world needs right now? People need right now, from your experience, what you're seeing happening around, what would that message be? You know what? I, I, let me put the, I'll give you the, I'll give you that one bullet message, but let me put some context around it first. We live in a world where um, I think for decades, at least, the message of food and health has really about been about fear, shame, guilt, deprivation, elimination, restriction. And now is the time to change. So my, my message to people is that we can love our food and love our health at the same time. Try to align those two things, food and health. Do Go for the things that you love to eat that are healthy for you and enjoy your life. That's the best single message I can give. And it's different for everybody. And that's what allows you to personalize it. It's beautiful, doctor. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. Really, this has been something I've been waiting for. And thank you for being so generous with your information and in your books. It's literally like your book's a Bible. And anyone who needs to just move forward in their journey with health, we're going to put these books up in the show notes. And I hope to talk to you very soon again, doctor. Yeah. And, and by the way, for anybody who wants to continuously learn what I'm seeing, I do put out a free newsletter. Come to my website, drdrwilliamleeli.com. Um, you can sign up for the newsletter. I put, send it out um, twice a week. Uh, if you want to actually um, follow me on social, you'll get all the links to all the things that I'm doing. This is all about my mission. Uh, you know, I, I really want people to actually get excited about loving their uh, uh, health and loving their food at the same time. We'll have all of these put up in the show notes as well. So, you know, that, that's great, doctor. Thank you so much for your time once again. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, Luke. Stay tuned for more. We're going to continue our journey, learning, sharing, and evolving. <laughs>